So first programming assignment to basically everything should be up to date uh, in that the homeworks, programming assignments, and quizzes should all be graded. Uh, I just wanted to go over a couple uh, minor things about the programming assignment. So, and this is actually mostly Python and not reinforcement learning, but I can't help myself. Um, so one, make sure you're using uh, list comprehensions or rather consider learning and using list comprehensions, right? right. So uh, an example might be if you had, let's say, total equals zero for uh, i and, I don't know, uh, mdp dot results for total equals some calculation. I appreciate that, Dave, thanks. So you're basically iterating right over this, whatever it is. And in this case, you want to accumulate a total. A simple way to do that would be create a list out of it. So uh, iterate over this, create some list, and take the total of that list. So this could also be the same as just sum of, and then we'll create a list with our calculation involving i, and put our for loop basically right in there for i in mdp.results4. and sum that up. So let, let me actually give you the meta lesson. So the meta lesson is learn your language and use it both appropriately and idiomatically, especially. So list comprehensions are a large, uh, an important Python idiom. So become comfortable with it, OK? A lot of people did use list comprehensions, and that's great. And um, list comprehensions can sometimes go too far. So if you have two nested for loops, uh, and you do not want to have a line that is you know, 160 characters long, uh, which makes it really hard to read. I did see someone who used a multi-nested one, but they did some nice um, formatting on multiple lines that make it look nice and readable. So that's one. But a second one is, I think, somewhat less no well known used by many of you, but certainly not by all, all of you, are dict comprehensions or dictionary comprehensions. So those are really pretty cool. Something like, let's say, um, O key, comma, F of key, right, some calculation for key in, let's say, mdp.actions. Right? The only real difference is you're using a curly brace instead of square brackets, and you have not just a value here, you have a key and a value. Right? So that makes you up a nice frame. So this would be ideal, let's say, for, we'll not call it key, we'll call it A for action, A for action, and we'll make this maybe 1 divided by length of mdp.actions. Right, so that gives you a nice equal probable policy. Questions on that? Does that make sense? All right, this is a almost every language, and it's expected that you're doing this for many of you, but you just have to break yourself of it. So this is if, if Boolean expression uh, var equals true, else var equals false. All right. How about, so basically you're saying, if this thing is true, the variable's true. And if thing is false, the variable's false. So that's the same thing as just saying var equals Boolean expression, which, like looks simpler and is easier, okay? 
and expresses your intent just as well. This is just so common. All right? If these are reversed, if this is a var equals false and this is a var equals true, put a not in here. All right? So if it's false and true, then throw in a not. Yep. Same thing for returns, right? If you're returning true or returning false, just return your Boolean expression. Uh, I'm just trying to remember if there was a third thing that I wanted to point out. This comes into conventions. Yep, and that's it. Okay, no, there is a fourth thing, and that is the tup tuple unpacking that Python provides. So I would have to look up to see if I have to do it exactly like this, but I know this will work. So let's say I have, I have my uh, environment, right, where I had state and reward pairs then with a probability. So something like this. So you could say, right, for, I don't know what it'll be, key in, what are we going to call this? Let's call this F. F. State equals key at 0. Reward equals key at 1. Probability equals F at key, okay? Sure, that works, but it's more lines and less clear. Better would be if you need both a key and a value as you're iterating over a dictionary, don't just iterate over the keys, iterate over the keys and the values by using, what is it, items? So items returns you a tuple of the key and the value. And so you can say for now key, comma, in this case it's the probability, and now we've got the probability. Right? Questions on that one? We're not done yet. Just want to make sure we're just doing one step for now. Okay? And then we can do the same thing and unpack the elements of the key tuple, and we can say, and this is where I'm not sure, but I know that works. I'm not sure if the parens are required. I bet they are. In fact, they would have to be, I would think. But I don't know what odds I would take. I'm at about 70 or 80%, right, if, if we had to bet on this. Does that make sense? And so then all of a sudden, right, SR or state comma R, and if the state is an XY value, well, let's just keep going again, right? We could say for x, y, comma, r, comma, p, right? Okay? Learn your tools well. <laughs> You're going to be learning Python a lot. Learn uh, all these ways of doing stuff. Okay. And some things you could do, you can just like, if you look at uh, sometimes the um, coding challenges, you know, for all these various languages, it can be really useful to go and look and see how is someone doing a very small problem, but how are they doing it, let's say, in Python, and wow, that's a really compact way to do it. Now, compact is not always good, but it's sometimes, it often can be good. Okay? So that's my, my two cents. I'm not dinging you at all when I see stuff like that, but I point it out when I see it. And if I say such and such code looked really clean, clean is good. Okay, so
so finishing up on Monte Carlo. And let me also first look at something. Let's look at the backup diagram of dynamic programming. Right, we've got a state. We have some potential actions. We take an action. We get some rewards. And so we're backing up the values from all these states, right? all these s primes, all the way up to s, using the probabilities that we know about, right? the probabilities for the environment and the probabilities for the policy. So we basically calculate a weighted sum right, to give us this weighted average. Whenever you see a backup diagram that has multiple lines coming out, that means we're doing some weighted average there. Okay. And on the other hand, if you see this, what does that mean? Uh, what if I, I'll help you out. And what if I put the word max next to it? <laughs> that would basically mean taking the max. So we've seen that in some cases, right, where we're, where we're looking at calculating the max there. If that's the case, we'll have this arc through it. And it means the max. A Monte Carlo diagram, right? We have a state, we have an action, we have another state, we have another action, and we keep going until we get to some terminal state. Right? And along the way, we're getting rewards. There's a reward down there and all the way, right? So here, we calculate the total return for the episode and apply it back to each of the states. Yeah. This is going to become relevant as we look at temporal difference learning today. For the Monte Carlo, when we talked about important sampling, right, we defined rho of t to, uh, let's say, capital uh, t minus 1 as the ratio between the probabilities of our having chosen, having realized this particular episode with the target policy versus the probability of having realized this episode with our behavior policy, right? So pi of this would be taking action k uh, in state k for consistency, we'll say t here, divided by the behavior policy. And then we've got to do that for all of the time steps, right? t plus 1, given we're in state t plus 1, the probability of the behavior of that. all the way until we get to our last capital T minus 1, given state capital T minus 1, over B of. And what we described is that this ratio, this entire ratio, which is the multiplication of all these sub-ratios, could get large or small, right? We're, we're weighting our return by this, and that leads us to have high variance, especially if our target policy has probabilities that are very different from our behavior policy. Okay. So one way that we dealt with that variance, Josh, is what? Right. What did we come up with as a way to not have such high variance and yet still use our importance ratio. So the first action in this state. So 
trying to think of that. We're still always updating all, oh, I see what you mean. The, um, No, that's not what we're talking about. We're, uh, we're talking about the uh, randomly starting in an SNA. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, so give me, give me a name for that, anyone? Exploring starts, thank you very much. Yes, so exploring starts is, is, is one way. But exploring starts, we're on policy, right? So the policy that we are evaluating or improving is the same policy that we are using to interact with the environment. So the important sampling we used as off policy, right? So where we have two policies, our behavior policy that we are interacting with our environment on, and our target policy, which is the one we're trying to evaluate or improve. So we use the importance uh, sampling ratio there so that we could try and adjust our returns. When we use the ordinary importance sampling, Right? We basically just took the average of our row times our return. Right? So the average of all those for every episode. Go ahead, Masta. This is like our lead into that. So yeah, that's, that's where we're going with this. So I'm just doing a little bit of a review. Right? And the review is these rows can be really big or really small, which causes us to have large variance uh, in our estimates. Okay? Unbiased, but large, large variance. So we had an adjustment to this so that we could have lower variance, although biased. But in, eventually, in the limit, we would end up uh, with the right uh, estimate. So, do you remember what that one was, Josh? Uh, Alfredo? Where's Alfredo here? Okay, we're just running through people. Uh, Varun. I don't think it's possible to say that, is it? I see. Yeah, so we got the weighted important sampling. This is not a philosophy class. Just don't worry. Kogato ergo non sum. OK, so um, the fix is for weighted. So what's the numerator? The numerator this looks like of just the average, right, is a row, right? And I'm just being very sloppy here and say this is summation over all of our, our episodes, right? And then the denominator is just the number of episodes. Yeah. And then the weighted case, we change it to be... So we just sum the probabilities. Yeah. Oh, we just, sorry, we just sum the ratio, the... Importance ratios, right? So we just basically do that, right? And so this is over, I'm going to just say here, episodes. And this is over episodes. Right? And even that's not 100% true, right? Because if you've got a every visit, you may have a estimate which one episode may give you multiple uh, estimated returns. And so that would lead to multiple entries in here. Yeah. Isn't it the one you have in every visit? You are just now approximating the mean um, differently? So like you're just basically having an average? Yeah, basically what's happening is if we have a every visit, we have multiple G of T's, right? So for every one of the times that we've seen that state, we have successively smaller sums of discounted rewards each of which is a separate estimate, and so each of which would enter into here, each with their own importance ratio, right? which would be truncated, just like we truncate the returns. 
right? So if we have a state here and the state appears here, we've got just the rewards from here to here and just the important sampling ratio from here to here. And then we've got another estimate of S, which includes a larger set of terms, the important sampling, and a larger set of terms, the rewards. It'd be nice if we could come up. Oh, there, good. So almost every time I remember to turn on do not disturb, <laughs> but apparently not every time. So it'd be nice if we could come up with a unbiased estimate that has fewer. This is really <laughs> annoying. Wait, is it still recording if you're doing this? Yes, it's still recording. Is that nice? <laughs> um, so what we'd like to have is an unbiased estimate with less variance. Okay. And there are two ways to do that. One way to do that is um, by using a discounting aware important sampling. And so that was a small section which wasn't assigned to you for uh, for the reading. Um, but basically, we just look at, I don't even want to get into it. So we're just not even going to get into it, okay? Uh, and it only works, though, if you have a, an actual discount, so a discount not equal one. The other approach we're going to look at here is the per decision important sampling. And that really, just says if you have a slightly more complicated calculation of your uh, of this value, that it will have less variance. All right. The reason for this is really relatively straightforward. So if we look at GT, right, it equals RT plus one plus gamma rt plus 2 plus so-and-so, right? And when we put in an importance ratio, then we right, just multiply this entire thing by our ratio. So rho t, t minus 1 r t plus 1 plus rho t t minus 1 gamma r t plus 2 plus so on. And now let's just look at an individual term in here, like this term. In fact, here's rho t t minus 1. That's kind of handy. Let's just look at that. So let's look at rho t t minus 1 times r t plus 1. So this is the first reward. It is getting multiplied, just like all the other terms in the reward, by our important sampling ratio. So we're taking this, multiplying it by this, which is the same thing as this, multiplied by r t plus 1. And if we look at this, we had an action that we took from this state that caused us this reward. Seems very reasonable that we're looking at the difference in these probabilities. If we took what the behavior said was a very unlikely possibility, and in our policy is very likely, then this reward that we got a sample of, we should weight a lot higher. Okay? But, We took this action in this state. We then got this reward, right? And then we took this action in the next state. How much does this affect that reward? We're just like, in deep, we got our reward, and then we go on and do other stuff after that. Whatever we do after we get that reward should not affect the reward. That's the basic idea here. So if you get a reward at a certain time step 
Only your actions before that should matter. And all your actions after that shouldn't matter. So just cross all these guys off. Okay. And in expectation, they're going to be one. Okay. If you look at the second reward, we should look at the first two terms of this. And the third reward, the first three terms. And our final reward, we should look at the entire sampling ratio. So our calculation here is slightly different. We're going to go ahead and modify this and say our adjusted reward is going to be not just our original reward times a single value. We're going to break up and take all the subcomponents in each individual reward and give it its own sampling ratio. So this one will be rho tt. This one will be rho t, t plus 1, all the way to rho t, capital T minus 1, gamma to the, I think that's the right number, r t. Why does this give us less variance, Matt? There we go. I was looking for you. You were too close. Why does this give us less variance than our original, where we just take rho t, t minus 1 times this entire thing? That's a good description. So each individual decision, let's say each reward that we get, which is a result of previous decisions, will have fewer factors that we're multiplying by. So fewer of these non-one factors. Okay. And so we should end up with less variability. Okay, if we have a one-half factor, let's say as the last choice here, in our original calculation, we're going to have one-half times all of these sums of discounted rewards. As we've manipulated it now, this is only going to affect the final reward. Right? This final reward is going to get that extra one-half factor, and all the rest will have that one-half factor taken out. Does that make sense? That is per decision important sampling, yeah. But if, if you use this strategy a lot, you're, you're unable to use weighted. You are unable to use weighted. The book says that there's no known approach to doing weighted important sampling. Actually, if you look in the literature, there is a, um, uh, an algorithm provided for doing it. I don't remember it, though, but it does exist. So, but yeah, you do lose out on the weighted. So, so the question is, does this reduce the variance enough? And I don't have a good in-practice answer for you. OK. Other questions? Does that make sense? Does the intuition especially make sense? Because from my point of view, you can recreate this as long as you just remember the intuition that decisions after you get a reward don't affect the reward. And then the rest kind of follows from that. Okay. So the stuff. issue with variance is it just has to do with the time frame and everything? Or could it actually not allow us to ever converge? Mm, no, we will converge. It just may affect the time to convergence. Any questions before we leave Monte Carlo and go on to temporal difference learning? So temporal difference learning still has this aspect of rolling the dice, right? of taking a trajectory and seeing what happens as a way to approximate an expectation. But
unlike Monte Carlo, go back a second. Let's talk about this word, bootstrap. All right, bootstrap or bootstrapping? Bootstrap. There must be two Ps. Yeah, so bootstrapping. So bootstrapping is used in a variety of different situations. However, this is actually when I want to give the quiz. We'll just leave off what bootstrapping is. We're going to do the quiz because that will completely finish off the Monte Carlo. Okay. Virtual bodies and such.
And on that last question, if the space I gave you is like too small, just feel free to write it below. But it shouldn't be more than a few words. Glad this isn't what you're turning in. <laughs> I'll give it another minute. All right, if you can finish that up and pass it over, please, I'd appreciate it. All right, bootstrapping. So what is bootstrapping? First, what are bootstraps? These are bootstraps, right? Used to pull on your boots. Okay, some boots don't have them, they're harder to pull on. The theory is, if you pull up on the bootstraps hard enough, maybe you can just kind of pull yourself up into the air. Right? This first came from something like this, and I think the adventures of Baron Munchausen in the 1700s or something, where a guy supposedly pulled himself and his horse up by his pigtail. All right? It doesn't actually work. The idea is still there. So you may hear that someone has pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, right? They came, let's say, from a poor start, and they became self-made. That's the same idea. Computer. Boots. Where does anyone familiar with the term bootstrapping in computers? Yes, raise your hand. OK, how, how about booting a computer? Everyone know about that? Booting is just shorthand for bootstrapping. OK, so that's where the term booting comes from. Bootstrapping, so way back when, you go buy a personal computer. You spend thousands of dollars, you get. My first computer was only $300, which was dirt cheap. But it only had 2K of memory. Okay, um, And it actually did have a bootstrap program in it. But many didn't. You buy a computer, you turn it on. And now it's got memory, but no program in it. And so you had to enter a program. And so you would do that on the front, on the console, like go and select a memory address, and then set some settings, kind of to set the bits, to set the memory values, and do enough of that so you had enough initial instructions so that it would go start running. That's the idea of bootstrapping, giving it enough initial instructions. So today, when you bootstrap, you start your computer, and it starts ex executing from where? Anyone? Like, where's the code come from that it starts? Yeah. Yeah, it's a BIOS. It's in, it's in, in, in ROM, basically. 
But as far as the processor is concerned, it just, when it starts up, goes to a particular location in memory and starts executing instructions. So it's got those built-in instructions it starts executing. And then where, then what happens? Like what next when you boot? Bootloader where? Yeah. On your disk. It will then go to your disk, right? So it'll go to your disk, and it has enough, basically, in the in-memory thing to load one sector of disk from, you know, from a known location and then start executing that. And that then has enough to go, let's say, load a boot record and some other stuff to figure out what operating system to load if you have a multi-boot system. And then that has enough to load more. And basically, you're just going from this tiny kernel of stuff getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That is bootstrapping. OK? So you can freak people out if you talk about, yes, I'm bootstrapping my program or my computer. Um, but that is what booting stands for. For function approximation, bootstrapping is this idea of starting with a value, like in Newton's method, whatever value you got, and getting a better value and a better value and a better value and a better value. So in Monte Carlo method, do we use bootstrapping? Sina. That is, do we have an initial value of a state and get it better and better and better? OK. So do we, when we started the Monte Carlo method, initialize, let's say, our Q values or our Vs to anything? Yeah, exactly. You are correct that we don't use bootstrapping. We set initial Q values for every SA pair to random values, but we never use those to update any other values. That's the key part we're missing in the bootstrapping. So we have some, we'll call them defaults. Until we have some better estimate, we'll use this default. But as soon as we get a better estimate, throw away that original and replace it. As opposed to dynamic programming, where we set some initial values. And then, when we're updating S, we say, well, let's go look through all the possible actions, all the possible results we could get, all the S primes we could be in, and then go ahead and say, update this state based on the weighted values of each of these states. And that'll give this one a better value. And then when we go do, you know, when that's then at the bottom of another one, whatever's at the top will get a better value, and we'll keep getting better values. Does the difference make sense? OK. So Monte Carlo, non-bootstrapping. DP, bootstrapping. And TD, which is temporal difference learning. also uses bootstrapping. We can actually tell just by the backup diagram that this uses bootstrapping because we're updating this state based on the values of these other states. OK? As opposed to the Monte Carlo, where does the value of this state that we're updating depend on the estimate of this state? No, we're just looking at the entire return and then updating our estimates of all of the intervening, all the states in the episode, or at least the first of them. I guess Asta. Is that it's not like after we do one episode, then we do this again with another episode, we stop caring about whatever happened in the first episode. Like we still want to incorporate all of those estimates. We're still averaging them. Right, we're still averaging. So is that, that different than the chat? Yes, because we're just averaging some independent values that we've gotten, right? We've just got a big urn of balls, and we're pulling out balls and trying to come up with what is our expectation of you know, the value or the color or whatever it is we're trying to find out about this distribution of balls. And so the more we get, the more accurate we are. But we can't just throw away our old knowledge. So bootstrapping is separate from just policy Yes, bootstrapping is separate from policy iteration. Because even in the case of Monte Carlo, we can do policy iteration. Because we can say, once we have done an episode or some episodes, we now have a more accurate uh, 
value function, and therefore we can improve our policy. Um, Shannon, you had a question? You had a question, Daniel? Uh huh. So in the right in the Bellman, we've got this. So let's see. Let's just look at it in, in terms of the value function, right? Uh, and whether we use s t plus one or s prime, it it it, it, it doesn't particularly matter. But so what do we got? We got a expectation over you know, pi. So that's going to be over actions, right? So a uh, pi of a given s, and then an expectation of s prime and r. Let's just say v of s, right? P s prime come on r given the current state in action times then, right, the reward. Let's say lowercase r so it matches plus gamma. V of S prime. Right. This actually all goes back right to V of S, right? We actually define V of S to be the expectation, right, of G sub T given that S T equals S. We can throw in a pi here if we want, right, according to following the policy pi. And so Monte Carlo and dynamic programming kind of use this in two different ways. Monte Carlo says, it says G of T. OK, let's estimate G of T. How do we estimate G of T? Run an episode and calculate G of T. Right? It's just the discounted reward. So we do a bunch of these different samples to try and find out what G of T is. That's very direct. DP says, let's go ahead and look at the Bellman equation, right? Which basically spells out the expectation recursively. And let's just use that recursive definition as a one step update. Doing, calculating these actual uh, uh, weighted sums, for the expectation. Yeah, you got to have this. You got to have this. If you do not have the, the characteristics of the environment, you can't do dynamic programming. So, because it's a model-based system. We're, so we're going to be good. So we're just, we're just working our way into this. So, so this is model-free. Model-free means we don't need P. Okay. So there is. some unknown in the Monte Carlo, right? Unknown in the Monte Carlo is what is this actually an expectation? We're going to just go ahead and take samples to try and approximate the expectation. Here, what we don't know is these values. And so we're going to go ahead and use them in this bootstrapping approach to say, well, as we go ahead and do a single update, we're going to get closer to our true Value function. The, One other small thing to say. Yeah, that that's okay. With the uh, Monte Carlo, is it more so the action state pairs? Or are we still working with values? It depends. We could just as well approximate Q of SA. It's just a little easier to write if we're just doing the V. Um, but we could put in the A here and say, given that AT equals A. And then that's exactly what we're doing. You're right. And the reason in a model free, that we actually want the Q functions is because that's the only thing that tells us what to do. Because having the values doesn't actually tell us, I'm in this state, I would like to do the action that gives me the best next value, but I don't know what actions take us to what states, so that doesn't do me good. So yeah, we, we could use P. I'm just generally saying state, uh, sorry, value functions right now, though, to stand in for both. So in temporal difference learning, we're gonna, we're gonna take a combination of the two, sort of. We're going to say we're going to both do sampling and 
we're going to have to use the current estimate of whatever our S prime is. Okay, so there's two level, two elements of uncertainty there. One that we're doing a sample, and the second that we don't actually know at the next level what S prime is. But let me show you the backup diagram, which will be underwhelming, I'm sure. S a S prime, and we got an R. That's it. We're going to go one step. We're going to say, what reward did we get? Okay. This is a sample. There are a lot of possible rewards we could have gotten. Basically, if we take this action, right, in the um, DP approach, we know all the possible rewards we could have gotten and next states we could have gone to. Here, we're just rolling the dice and picking one, okay, according to the P distribution. So we get one. So, so we have a sampling, which is giving us a sample of what the R and the S prime are, instead of taking the weighted sum. But also, we don't actually know this value. So R and S, this is not a good pen. R and S are a sample. In fact, let's just look at this. This is a sample, right? And here, These are approximates, right? They are over time getting better, but at the beginning, they're just random crap. Here, we have both a sample and an approximation. Okay? The rule itself is so simple. The rule itself is going to be basically V of ST equals we don't need no stinking summations, okay? We're going to just say, let's update V of ST by adding, we're going to have some alpha, which is our, our rate that we're using, just like we used before. We have a step size, a constant step size, or one over n. We're going to use a constant step size, and we're going to multiply by What do we want to multiply by? We want to multiply by kind of our, our error, right? Whatever our error is, however we define error. Hmm. Nelson, how might we think of defining error? Okay, so let's look at that. R minus V of ST. So this is what we expected, right? I mean, that's our best estimate of what our reward is from this function, from this state. This is our immediate reward that we got. What else do we get, though? Plus. Gamma, V of S, here I'm going to use T plus 1, right? Whatever the next state is. This is, let's call it our target. This is what we think, this is our best estimate of the total reward from being in this state that we have. Okay, let me back up a second. That's not our best estimate. That is our estimate by this sample. Okay, we took a sample and it told us, the sample told us, here's the reward, here's the state. That's the blue part, right, from our sample. And then we said, okay, what is it worth being in that state? And that's our estimate. 
We discount it. We add it together. That's our best target. Do we want to just say, OK, V of ST equals that? No, because then all of a sudden, as we start taking samples, our, our estimate is just going to be moving all over the place, right? Whatever we happen to get in the luck of the, uh, luck of the draw. And we don't want it to move over the one all over the place. We want it to converge. And so therefore, we are going to update our V of ST by a fraction of the error. Dan? Why is this called temporal difference? Because, and when I first heard this, it seemed crazy to me. So, because um, here's, here's basically, we have a time step, and we have an estimate of what will happen right? if we take an action. So that's the temporal is the time. So our time is from t to t plus 1. So at time t, we have this estimate of what the state is. We take a step. We see what happens. We look and say, what would we have estimated from here? and the reward we got, and add them together and use them to update the previous time step. So we take one step, update the previous time step, with what seems like not much information, one reward, and knowing what time, where we are. Yeah. Is there, is alpha, I'm hoping that alpha is not just constant, because for the exact problem that you mentioned, it's just like bouncing around. Um, and the fact that we ultimately want to convert to rather the state that has been used, but we would want there to be some sort of sense of aggregation of all these different increments that we're doing. Um, and because when we do like the thousandth increment, we already like have 999 other ones that we've looked at, we would want that to be discounted in a way of its own. So is there a temporal element to alpha? Well? There can be, so you can anneal it over time, reduce it over time. But if it's small enough, what happens is this expectation you're going to still wobble around the true expectation, but your mean is going to be of, of these values is going to be that expectation. So there's going to be a little, you're not going to like get zero error, but your error will have a zero expectation, if that makes sense. So there'd be a little wobbling around. So you can anneal it, uh, which that is just change it over time or you can just keep it small. But it is a weighted exponential, you know, move, an exponential moving average, right? That's what that, we've seen, that's what happens when you have a constant step size. So this also will work in a non-stationary environment, right? So if your environment changes, are your way old, long information is gonna kind of drop off from this and your most, more recent stuff will matter more. So you can track that. And then just to clarify one more thing, when you, the error you were discussing is the, the error in our estimate of the different values of the states. And in expectation, those discrepancies, like there's the discrepancy between what we say is the value of the state versus the true value of the state, those things have an expectation of zero. Yes, that difference has an expectation of zero. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. yes. Um, so let me back up a second. TD is a whole family, really. <laughs> right? This is what we're using just for um, evaluation of a policy. We're going to see that there are some different ones we need to use for control. Just like in Monte Carlo, we can't use this for control. This does us no good for figuring out what to do. So we're going to have to have something similar to this with Q instead of, instead of S. And there are some tweaks that we can make, uh, that, can make it, that can make it better. We can add a little bit of information for Monte Carlo to do it. Um, but in general, in general, if you could use DP, you probably would best, best off using DP. And DP means you know all about the environment, and the state space is small enough that you can afford to, to, to keep that information to your computation. 
Uh, otherwise, often, TD is what's going to be used. Okay. What's the big advantage you can see over TD versus Monte Carlo? Uh, Sean, is there any advantage you can see, even just based on the backup diagram, as a, uh, with the, the kind of a problem, the kind of an environment or a problem that you can try and tackle? Certainly less memory because you don't need to keep that entire episode. That's true. Although we're going to see there are some advantages for keeping an entire episode and replaying them later. But we'll see that in a bit. Uh, are there particular types of problems that you might want to solve with reinforcement learning? Um, I'd imagine scenarios where, like, Do you remember? Th th yeah, th say it again. We're making certain moves. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've been um, in a computable scenario. Okay. What about ones? Where did we have to have a discount factor that was not one? What sorts of problems? Uh, never ending. Never ending. How well does Monte Carlo work with never ending problems? Rather poorly. Rather poorly. I mean, it's, it's pretty good once you get your first episode done, uh, but it takes actually forever to get that first episode, right? Um, or even if you've got problems that might be never ending, uh, then that's a problem, right? If you've got a grid world policy that goes you know, left, right, around in a square, so you've got a little never ending thing. Well, take it back. Grid world is infinite on its own. Imagine a maze where your policy somehow tails you to go in a little circle. And once you've got that, you're, you're toast. So TD is good for learning just from each step in the process. Okay. Um, Let's go ahead and look at what we might be able to use as the Q version of this. Okay. So I know we're going to start like this, right? Q. Um, say STAT equals, and I know we're going to be like that, right? plus alpha times our error. I know that our error is going to end with what our current estimate is. 